thanks for being here. Uh, an exciting time, an exciting week. Um, a lot's transpired since December 26, when my wife and my kids uh, arrived here in Charlottesville at the Residence Inn. And um, I've been really, uh, I feel really fortunate to be here, really lucky to be the coach of this team, and and uh, anxious to um, to get this started um, in terms of the season and find the the launch point uh, of where our team currently is um, in all different areas, from the effort component, from the execution component, from the chemistry component, and have a clear indicator, uh, uh, at least versus an opponent, uh, where we're starting from. And so I'm looking forward to it. I'll take whatever questions anyone has. Jeff White, VirginiaSports.com. More often than not at BYU, you had a FCS team on the schedule. Do you like these games? And if so, why? Oh, uh, it, it depends. Um, at, at BYU, rarely, if, ev if ever, was it the first game. I think, you know, especially as the Independence era moved on, it was later in the year. And it, it simply just depends based on where our current team is, what our needs are, which FCS team it might be. And um, I remember one year uh, playing Northern Iowa. And a lot of similarities. They had just finished um, in the semifinals the year before and were a very strong team and a strong program that knew how to win. And I thought they were a very good football team and a, a significant, significant test for us. Um, sometimes when you get into conference play and then might have to stop to play an FCS opponent or any other opponent for that matter, um, it's quite different. And we're really uh, not acknowledging uh, FBS or FCS. This is a, a, a football team that I think is really well coached and they know how to win. And that in and of itself is hard to earn and they have done that. And so um, we, we think um, Richmond is a challenging opponent uh, right from the beginning and uh, certainly uh, um, some, someone and some uh, team that we have to take really seriously with the amount of unknowns we currently have. Doug Dowdy from the run of Times. If you can remember back to your BYU head coaching debut, are there any lessons that you <laughs> learned at that point that you continue to impart today? Yeah, uh, um, I'll never forget. Um, my first, my first uh, game as the head coach, we were playing at home in Lavelle Edwards Stadium uh, versus Boston College. And I chose to uh, punt on fourth down late in the game rather than go for it, and I got booed. <laughs> and I realized really quickly, oh, so this is what being a head coach is like. I'd never had 65,000 people boo me before. <laughs> and, uh, and so I realized right then um, just what uh, – what was now at stake and what comes with the visibility. And I learned a lot um, about that in, in terms of um, really not trying to please everyone, and, and uh, nor is it possible, nor should it be your intent. And so I've learned a lot about game management, still not perfect. I've learned a lot about being a head coach, still not perfect. <laughs> and, uh, and I've learned a lot about just about myself, and certainly still not perfect. Andrew Ansbacker, the hey. Daily Progress. Uh, look at the depth chart here. Linebacker, it seems Corey Jones and Chris Peace uh, emerged there. No Malcolm Cook on any of those spots. What kind of played out there at that position? Yeah, the, there has been a situation with Malcolm Cook that uh, uh, I can't speak much on, um, but there's a medical situation that happened um, recently with that. And so um, there'll be more details coming through the appropriate channels when that's available. But that had a lot to do with um, the way the depth looks there. Uh, Ed Miller from the Virginia Pro How are you? Uh, the number selection process continues. What was that like? How did Dante Wilkins end up with number one? Did he literally have the first selection? Uh, no, he didn't have the first selection. It, it was an amazing night. Um, I, I would say one of the most memorable of my coaching career to this point. Really, really special. Um, the task unit leaders, which our team is divided up into different units, um, similar to the military, you could call them platoons or um, in groups of 6 to 12. And the, the team governance model um, uh, um, takes care of each other, really. And so uh, the task unit leaders were the ones that selected the order in which our team were teammates. Their teammates were to choose the numbers. And so I wasn't the one selecting, nor, was, nor were any of the coaches. And so really, this was peer-driven. 
I thought that would have a lot more impact on the players knowing when they were selected by their peers to choose a number. And, and I think that um, it allowed really uh, a, a lot of transparency as to um, what their teammates valued. And it doesn't take long before you see a thread kind of emerging of what the team members were selecting on. The first selection, the first jersey selection was actually Jordan Ellis, and which was an, a remarkable pick uh, for an amazing young man. Um, and the only other one I'll mention is Dante Wilkins had the second pick, uh, voted on by his peers. And, and so the, the orders were not reflective of um, so the first pick wasn't number one, the second pick wasn't number two. That just means they got to select the jersey number they would like in order. Um, and we selected 61 um, to this point that have qualified. Um, I don't ever intend to travel more or dress more than 72. And so there are 11 jersey spots remaining. Uh, those are announced now each Thursday going into um, uh, or completing a game week. So there will be others to follow. Uh, no first years were allowed to select. Um, uh, that was my call on that first night. Hank Kerr's with the Associated Press. Hey. Um, there's obviously a lot of excitement going into this, you know, a new regime. And we've heard all about the, the team buy-in and stuff. How will you try to manage that excitement, I guess, uh, this week so it doesn't become, you know, yeah, too much? Um, really? Uh, the, the best stance is to, to under-promise and over-deliver. Um, I think the promise comes from people just seeing um, and believing this will work by past history. And so I don't think anyone wonders if we'll win or not. The biggest question is when and with whom and where are we starting from. And so uh, I don't know any of those answers right now, but I do know the team is working hard. I do know they really want to uh, have success. They're still learning how. And so they've had um, a number of practices now versus uh, an opponent look. Um, and that's a first for them. Today was the first Monday of a game week. Uh, that's a first for them. And each one of those things is taking extra energy and anxiety as they find out new things. And the game will be the same. And so uh, uh, I feel a huge responsibility to my team to just simply put them in the best position possible with a game plan they can manage or have their best chance to manage to give them their best chance to start from. And that's, that's my commitment to them. And then we'll take whatever feedback comes from this game and we'll apply it and move on. And it will be a step-by-step -step process. We're not going to launch right to the top of the ACC or the polls in game one. We are going to, um, uh, we've already practiced how to come out of the tunnel, for heaven's sakes, um, even to get on the field. And you know where we go um, when players come off the field uh, for breaks. So there's a lot of new things happening here. Um, but again, I'm comfortable and confident that the preparation we put in so far will emerge at some point. And, but I don't know when. Thinking back to your introductory press conference, you, at some point you talked about the, the schedule you had formed for BYU for 2016 yeah. and challenges with it. As you assessed this schedule, what, was, what kind of came to mind? And uh, this, this is a program that's played really difficult schedules in the past. Is this one fair? What, what were your thoughts of it? Well, I, I, I'm not sure I can even answer until I, I see us play. Um, and so I know it's difficult to win any games as a college football coach. And I, I've, I've said that. Uh, and maybe the fans at BYU got tired of me saying that. But there's a lot of work that goes into to preparing for a single game. And winning college football games is hard. And, and so there's nothing I'm taking for granted, um, even to the point where um, just a few days before the first game, we're, now we have jerseys with numbers on them. And, and so this is a step-by-step -step process with realistic expectations from my perspective, but with optimism that it will absolutely work out in the end. And again, um, it'll be fun to see where we're starting from. And I'm anxious to see that, just as I sure as as I'm sure you are and are the players. Um, there's a great um, principle that I talk to my team about. And for those that have studied history, there's um, a man named um, uh, James Stockdale, Admiral James Stockdale. And he was the highest ranking officer that was um, um, held in the Hanoi Hilton, which was a place um, where it was a difficult place to be. And he, seven years, I believe, he was there, tortured frequently. And they asked him when he left, um, 
what, what was it? How did you endure? How did you make it out? And, and what lessons were to be learned? And he said two things. Number one, I never lost faith that I would make it out. And then number two is I always confronted the brutal facts. The next day was going to be fiercely difficult. And so he talked about those that came and gone, came and went or that, that didn't make it out. And he suggested that most of them died from a broken heart. They'd have some deadline set. By Valentine's Day, they'd be out. And it would come and go. And um, their resolve just is what happened. It wasn't a physical characteristic. They died of a broken heart. And so I'm going to be as realistic with our fans as possible. We have a starting point. I have no, um, um, I have no um, worry that this will not work out. <laughs> um, and I know how hard it's going to be. And so now it's just a matter of time. But we will have success here. Um, and, but, and I'm going to work very hard in facing the brutal facts of where our team currently is, what we need to work on, and accelerate that as fast as possible. And I wish I could give you a time frame. But this is just, just a, a really kind of a monumental day of where we're going to start from. And I don't know what it will look like either. Hey, Coach. It's Brad Franklin with hey. CatsCorner.com. I, I know you don't talk about injuries, so I, I'll ask about Miles Robinson as the cornerback in front of as Tim Harris kind of rehabs from that shoulder injury. What went into to choosing Miles there, and kind of uh, what did you like about his camp? Um, trustworthy and reliable. Uh, it's just seemed um, through spring practice, and Miles wasn't in fierce condition in spring. But he took that feedback to heart, and he made significant advancements in that area, which allowed him to make more plays more often and do the right thing at the right time um, that allowed him to be trusted. Um, our depth is, is more um, reflective of trust than it is ability. And so um, in order to be trusted on our team, players have to try as hard as they can try and know what to do and be capable of making a play within their position. And if they're able to do those three things, then that earns them trust. And so Miles has, um, at that position, uh, been the next most trustworthy of, of players that we were able to evaluate. Doug Dowdy again. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Danny Rocco said last week that you were on the AFCA yeah. board with him. Did you know him before that? And how strange is it to have your first meeting with a guy be the guy who you're coaching against in your first? Yeah. Um, so I, I got to know Danny uh, again um, on the board, um, but I didn't know him nor pay um, as much attention um, to where he was coaching um, until I came to the University of Virginia and then realized he was at Richmond and realized that was the opener. And that then, um, and possibly for both of us, we started paying more attention to, oh, wait a second, that's, that's our first opponent. And I remember we were sitting out by the, or he was sitting out by the pool at the Fiesta Frolic, which is an event for college football coaches. And I saw him and I just went over and sat down and talked to him for a minute. And then I heard him speak at a function um, in Richmond. And it's been fun to learn about his career and then also watch his team play because I think they are well taught. And I don't think that they win by accident. Um, I think he's recruited well. I think he's coached well. I think his strategies are sound. And, and he has a really good program. So it's been fun to just put a name with a face and learn the history and then um, just see s um, some other things that uh, a really good coach is doing. He knows the stadium. Yeah, he knows the stadium, right, which is um, right now he knows it better than I do. <laughs> When you were hired, you knew it was roughly nine months before your first game. You also knew you had a million and one things to get done before the opener. Has this time just gone by in a blur because you've been in perpetual motion? It, it, it's been um, amazingly um, busy, but not chaotic. Um, there is a plan. There, is, there has been a progressional approach to the plan with a clear sense of identity and vision that we're working toward. Um, and each step along the way through um, spring practice, through the, the winter conditioning, through the summer and through fall camp, I've been able to establish in what I think are benchmarks of where we might be. Um, none of those really um, are as accurate as I would like them to be. Uh, I would hope by years of experience that I would have some idea. And I think the metrics and benchmarks, I'm in the ballpark. But really, until you play, there's always surprises. There were surprises with our first scrimmage in fall camp um, and just what it looked like to move our team from the practice field to the stadium and practice there. Um, and then to move the, the practice from 
from pra the practice field to Lambeth, and there's a different sense there, and so each thing is new, and I'm, I'm determining the amount of slippage each time when we move and how strong the execution holds and, and what things might affect the team as I get to know them better. Um, so really, it's, it's time. The next step in our program's development is to play a football game, and that will give me a great chance um, to determine and hopefully every I's been dotted and T's been crossed in terms of preparation, I'm sure there will be surprises as rarely do things go according to script. And in fact, one of the things we practice is very seldom does the team know what period is coming next because it doesn't go according to script. And so I'm hopeful that they're resilient and confident when transition and change happens. And, uh, but we'll see. Uh, Jerry Rackliff, Daily Progress. Hey. Um, You've featured one of the most dynamic offenses in the country over the years, and can you just talk a little bit about what you like about that style of play sure. and how much you've tweaked it uh, in recent years? Um, I, I like, um, as a defensive coach, I like offenses that stress the opponent, either by um, tempo of play, by um, adjustments required, um, by personnel matchups that are necessary, but if you can do all three of those, those are the most dynamic ones to play against. Uh, if you had a chance, um, I'm trying to think of the last time that Virginia played Boise State, um, but that would be a team that the tempo in and of itself is very unique. The type of plays you defend are very dynamic and the matchups that are um, orchestrated. And they've had success. In terms of a price per victory, they're number one. When I was at BYU, we were number three in terms of the amount we had to pay for victory in terms of a bargain um, because they did the most with what they have and the tempo was very fast the formational adjustments are very challenging and then the personnel matchups are difficult and so um, from a defensive perspective I like that and so um, we'll do as much of those three components as we possibly can tailored to the existing people we have and their current capabilities and so that's what I like about it ultimately points win and however you score them is good. And so um, this, this uh, offense has scored enough points to help us win a lot of games. And ultimately, that's how I measure it. Does it score enough points to help us win? And that answer is yes. But the three things that I just mentioned are usually the way that the points come about. Ed Miller from Norfolk again. Um, I think you mentioned earlier in camp about the need to develop physicality on defense. Probably not a measurable, but something you can look at as an eye test. Where, where does that stand? Uh, work in progress. Um, it, it's a very unique challenge right now um, that the players and the coaches are meeting head on. So if, if, you, if you take um, countering forces of a culture that needs to become more physical and, um, and want to be more physical, then with the roster management issue of not much depth, those two are clashing head on, meaning that each um, impact uh, increases the risk of roster management. <laughs> Each time you don't um, take on uh, one of those physical challenges, the culture probably takes a hit. And there's a foundational piece to this of how fast or is it culture over immediacy or is it immediacy over culture? And I'm building this for the long term. And so uh, I'm working to have a fresh, fast football team for the first game, um, but not expense of the culture. And so that is the current situation I'm in, and there's not an easy answer to that. And that's where some of the intuition, as well as the GPS monitoring, <laughs> helps. Um, but we're, we have a ways to go still. Hey, Bronco, in the back. Hey. Damon Dillman from CBS 19 here in town. A lot of details came out over the weekend about like the jerseys and the numbers on the helmets, the diamonds in the end zone. A lot, a lot of it, a tip of the cap, I guess, to the history of this program. Why is that so important to you? Uh, I just. Um, this isn't about me. Um, I, I'm one of the, I'm not going to say one of the few coaches. What, what matters to me is, is amateur sport, student athletes, and, and highlighting institutions and having a football program representative of the institution, um, unique and specific to them. And so I'm not anxious to have um, uh, UVA be BYU or vice versa. Um, I'm anxious for you to be UVA to be UVA, and and so as I'm learning, I'm still learning, but I had to make some decisions because we're in the season, and so I was I was thinking, you know, what what would honor 
and what is maybe the epitome of, of and what would unite the most people of the multiple eras together to celebrate the University of Virginia. And, and the diamonds in the end zone to me were captivating because I saw a picture of not an empty seat and UVA beating Florida State and I thought that would be uh, a cool thing uh, as a symbol. Uh, I saw an old helmet in, um, in the stadium that had numbers on both sides. It was orange and had numbers on both sides with a single stripe. And so the idea of, okay, how do I incorporate that, but then send a message that we intend to take that and add to it. You know, so not in place of, but in, because every player and coach that's been here, man, they've, they've tried their best. And, and so um, where it is now is, is what I've inherited. And so I'm hopeful to just pass on. I'm lucky to be here. I'm lucky to have this opportunity. Uh, it's not only about us, it's about all that have played here moving them forward and, and hopefully that's the way it's coming across because that's the intent. Coach in the back, Sean Robertson, CBS affiliate in Richmond. In regards to Ben Kirk, your starter, as you watched him during camp, how pleased were you in how he was able to handle some of the principles, you know, the philosophies that he learned at his prior school and the principles that you are preaching here at UVA? Well, I, I'm not going to call it a, a seamless transition, but it's close. I think having played under Coach Ruff, even though he and I are different personalities, Coach Ruff is, he ran a great program and they won a lot of games. And Coach Ruff asks a lot of his players. And so uh, Kurt came wanting a challenge and he came wanting um, an opportunity and he came wanting uh, to do hard things. And so, man, when a player comes with that mindset already, really anything we've been able to throw at him, he just smiled and said, that's why I'm here. And so Coach Ruff really deserves a lot of credit for the training Kurt received and the preparation he received and probably for him even being at UVA. Um, the staff calls you, uh, Coach Ruff our most valuable coach because of Kurt. Um, so, uh, but beyond, I think, if you look behind that, it's because of how he prepared that particular young man and how he prepared his team. And there's uh, quite a bit of crossover between us in terms of maybe not methodology, but intent. Hey, Coach, Dennis Carter hey. from the ABC affiliate in Lynchburg. Big year for Dylan Sims this year. He's been with the program uh, a long time. He moves into the field goal kicking duties this year. What's impressed you about Dylan? Well, Dylan is, um, uh, he's battling and so he has a responsibility um, and an opportunity, uh, like many of us do in life, to make the most of. And he's trying as hard as he can to be consistent for his team. And, and that uh, is something that I think is a great lesson for any of us. And so I think he's, he's working hard to live up to expectations and responsibilities. I think he's sincere and authentic about how he's going about it. And I think he's doing everything he can to, to help our team win. And, and that really is, is I think um, a, a powerful lesson and, and meaningful for his future. And I think not only I, but the players hope he can have the success that, that he's shooting for. Yeah, Andrew again from Daily Progress. A little bit of follow up on, on Ben Kirk. You've had, I think, in your BYU career, six first time starters. Sometimes it's been on a week's notice, sometimes it's been on a whole off season's notice. How do you treat those in terms of game planning and, and maybe in this particular situation, what's that like with, with Kurt? Yeah, Kurt, um, it's interesting. While he'll be a first-time starter, he certainly doesn't uh, practice or manage practice like he's a first-time starter. And I think that's in answer to your question. Uh, you have to go off what you see um, as the indicator, and it doesn't seem like much now. And I might be surprised game bait, but it doesn't seem like the game is too fast for him that the stage is too big for him, or that um, um, he doesn't maintain poise. And so it seems like he's prepared well, and is prepared well for the stage that he's going to be on. And um, I'm anxious to monitor that and see it. Um, it's, it won't be hard. Uh, but I think, he, I think the game is um, manageable for him as a starter without much need to tweak game plan Certainly, we've already made changes for what, he's, what his strong suits are within the plan, but there really isn't much that's going into, um, okay, will he be ready? 
we're just planning on treating him like he's a starting quarterback and possibly with more experience than a first-time starter. That's, it's more in that direction than, than this is this first college game. Coach, one of the, I guess the position battles you had mentioned uh, last week was at defensive end where uh, Stephen Wright, I guess at this point at least, is listed over Eli Handback. What went into that decision and what did you like from what you saw from Stephen in camp? Um, so Stephen has become, again, it, it goes back to trust and in the right place more frequently, more often than what he was in the spring and making more plays within his assignment, within his technique. Uh, it's interesting because he had a very strong academic semester as well, and so there's been not only a production change on the field for Steve, and there's been a, been a life change. And all those things together uh, have allowed him just to have this um, momentum being generated to where it shows in practice. And it really isn't anything Eli has not done, and Eli will play a lot. Um, it's just Steven has had, a, I think, more of a life breakthrough right now than a position breakthrough. Take questions from Doug and Hank and Andrew and then wrap it up. Okay. Roughly how many players still are, are working toward getting a number and will there will that number be uh, reduced during the week? Can they still get a number if they don't have one? Yeah, that they can still get a number if they don't have one. Um, I, I'm not a, a fan of duplicate numbers. Um, I'm a fan of a single number and a player earning that. Um, and so we have multiple jerseys left. Again, rarely will I dress more than 72. And so there's 11 current spots remaining. And the players know that. And the coaches know that. And the equipment manager knows that. And so there's an urgency um, to every practice. And our first years, um, it'll be interesting to see how many of them are able to step up and earn their way into the depth chart. Usually a way a first year will be able to earn a jersey will be becoming a starter um, in some capacity or earning his way into the two deep. And because if they come to the stadium with the jersey, that means they're going to travel to the first game. Um, and so that standard's pretty high. Uh, and there are also players, if there's been a, a player that might be uh, have a discipline issue or something that is currently working with me on, they're not allowed to select either until those issues are cleared. And so I think you'll see this process go on. My guess would be the entire season, um, but hard to guess how that's going to play out. Just so you know, with no duplicate numbers, you've become the favorite coach of every staff crew. Really? <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll count that as a small victory uh, from my first press conference here, in-season press conference. Hank Kurz with AP again. You don't hear a lot about teams practicing how to come out of the tunnel or a coach going all, going through all the history of the program. And uh, it, it seems like you have your fingers on every bit of everything. Is that normal? And, and why is it that you're so particular that way? Uh, I'm not sure why I'm so particular. One of my core beliefs, though, is that organizations are perfectly designed for the results they get. And so if we don't know how to come out of the tunnel and haven't practiced it, then it wouldn't be a masterpiece. <laughs> and at some point, I want this program to be a masterpiece for college football. But more specifically, I'd like UVA football to be um, recognized as that. And I don't want it to be any other program. I want it to be specific to Charlottesville and specific to UVA that honors what's unique and great about this place. Because I think that's what's so cool about college football is this isn't any other place. This is Charlottesville, Virginia. And, and so I might have brought um, unique schemes and strategies and coaches from all over the country, but we're doing our best to, to be embedded into and become residents of this community and contribute to this community. Um, and, and honor how lucky we feel to be here. And so it, it's just authentic. I, I, uh, so much in the world right now is what is given to people, and, and I want to acknowledge all the cool things that are already here and then celebrate that, hopefully with the good football team that plays well so everyone can celebrate how nice it is to be in Charlottesville. And, oh, yeah, and we got great football too. And it could be a great gathering place for people to, to be on a Saturday. And, again, I, I don't know where it will start. Um, we'll all find out soon enough, and then we'll just chip away at it from there. If I could follow up real quick, um, just in light of what's happened this weekend, do you have a national anthem policy for you? Wow. So I didn't know about that. Um, thanks to Jim, he just gave me a heads up as to what might come up. I don't have a national anthem policy uh, other than just I feel fortunate to live in this country. And uh, my simple policy um, 
back to the earn not given mentality is I really ask my players to contribute to and do everything they can to make it better. Um, there's plenty of people that, that find fault with things and that's part of being a co coach. Right? I, I won't be always liked and there'll be things that, that can be talked about but I'm going to try as hard as I can to make it better. And that's all I would ask my players to do is um, before they uh, protest anything, have they done all they can do uh, to make it better? And if they can, that's, then that would be fair. In your review of history and the diamonds in the end zone, that picture, the quarterback that day was Marcus Higgins. Exactly right. H how that had has, something to do with it. He, he has kind of, he's the one guy that, that's, that's been, this is, you know, his era just continues on Saturday where yours gets started. I know thinking back to when you rehired him, I guess, it wasn't automatic. What has he done these last eight months that's been beneficial for you in making this transition? Marcus is a fantastic person, and I might have shared this publicly. I might not have. I have some criteria for who I work with. Number one is I have to like him, um, and I just simply won't work with people I don't like. Um, and I'm in a lucky spot because I get to choose. And what a drag it is to go to work with people you don't like. And so I'm not going to do that. And lucky enough, um, that there's been enough success where I get to choose. The second criteria is they have to like each other. <laughs> that means the people I work with have to like being around each other. And does that make it so much more fun? So I love Marcus, don't just like him. And our staff loves him, don't just like him. And then the third criteria is they have to be really good at what they do. And he is. And when you work with people that you love and they love each other and they're good at what they do, it's fun to come to work every day. And so those are the criteria that I use, and I think that's why so many families came, and it's why we like work every day. It doesn't guarantee immediate, immediate success, but it will guarantee long-term success. And plus, you'll see smiling people. And um, I use the same for recruiting. I'm not bring, bringing in a player in that I don't like, and that our team doesn't like. Why would I do that? Um, it's uh, toxic to the culture, and it's not nearly as much fun. So. Going back to Coach Hagen's, we love him. We don't just like him. Staff loves him and his wife and kids. And um, he's really good uh, as a receivers coach. Before we wrap up, do you want to announce our team captains? Oh, yeah, great. Um, our team captains, and so the way the team captains were selected, offensive players were allowed to select one name. Defensive players were also allowed to select one name to be their captain. On offense, um, Jackson Mateo was selected as our captain. On defense, it was amazingly tied. Uh, Micah Kaiser and Dante um, are our two defensive captains. And so I feel like the team is really selected well. Um, and those three captains will, um, uh, in many cases, be the voice of the program.